Okay, my name is Gail, and I'm 66 years old, and I am a retired nurse. I worked in the emergency department for, um, I can see you better. I worked in the emergency department for 23 years, and uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working in the jungle in Thailand by myself with the young uh, Karen man. And so it's been such a testimony that I want to bring you tonight. And uh, it's not a testimony about me and what I do and what I do for the people, but it's a testimony of what God does for me and what he does for those people. Because he picked that place for me to go. He has not released me yet. And I know why, because year after year, progress is made, but it's made very slowly. So, uh, but as you see, just a little change in the people, just somebody asking for a prayer, it's so encouraging. So I really wanna thank you for coming out tonight because I have a lot to tell you. And uh, I just wanna testify how good God is because only by the grace of God am I still alive. I should have died maybe six times I know for sure, but I'm sure there's other times I'll find out when I get to heaven. So before I start my program, which is on reckless abandonment, I want to pray. I will kneel, you don't have to. Dear Lord in heaven, tonight we want to give you the glory of our lives. We know that all good things come from you and we know that without you, we can do nothing. So we are totally dependent on you. Please bless our program, open our hearts, Lord, because every time we meet together to talk about you, we can move closer to you and we can learn from you. So bless us tonight and thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to back up 10 years to Christmas Day. 2008. It was December 25, 2008, and on that day, my husband left me of 22 years. And it is really amazing how that after 22 years and your life and your goals and your ambitions and your, your whole life can fall flat in just 10 seconds. I knew nothing that was really happening. And so in that less than 10 second period conversation, I was like in a pile of shattered remnants on the ground covered with dirt. And as in my trauma and in my uh, crisis, I turned to God. But also, you know, when you're in a crisis, you want a human being. So a pastor came to talk to me and to help me and my husband. But really, it didn't just happen at the right then. My husband really left me two years before that. So he was all prepared for this, but it was a shock to me. And so as this pastor was counseling me, it was like, I need to forgive and to stay. And I know that I need to forgive. And I, I really want to keep our family together because I have two young boys. And so as I worked and struggled along day by day, I knew it was not working. I had total evidence that it was not working. And so that was Christmas Day, but the time end of April came along, I was dying a little bit more every day. And you know, the Bible says that there's safety in a multitude of counselors. But you know, it, there is safety in a multitude of good counselors, but you know, counselors can let you down. They do not know what God knows for your life. And so as I was trying to stay in there and hang on, I heard God speak to me. And one day, as I'm walking behind our farm, we had a big ranch in Montana. And I'm in the out buildings behind our house. And as I'm walking and my husband is behind me, I hear this voice in my mind, and it's more clear and loud any time I've heard God talk to me. And this is what he said. He said, Ephraim is chained to his idols. Leave him alone. And now I'm in a whole nother crisis because all this time I'm thinking there's hope, and maybe we can make it, and maybe there'll be a change, and this will work. But now I know God said, leave him alone. 
So what in the world am I supposed to do? So I feel this crisis all over again, but I feel God is close. So that night, I sat at the kitchen table all night long, and I prayed, and I cried, and I read the Bible. And during that night, in the wee hours of the morning, I wrote a poem, Oh Dear Jesus, Take Control. And I don't write poetry. I'm no good at it. You know, you cross it out, and you write again, and that doesn't rhyme, and it's horrible. But that night, God wrote this poem, Oh Dear Jesus, Take Control, it's on your flyer. And from that moment on, God took control of my life. And big changes started to happen because I know now that counselor and all this that I was trying to do, God has a different direction for me. And it's all I want to do is obey God and follow him. And so when we're in our darkest, deepest crisis, God is there. And he has an answer for us. And he has a way to bring relief. Uh, it was shortly after that that my friend Lisa, that stood up a minute ago right there, she called me. And she says, you know, we need somebody to go to Thailand and relieve these missionaries on the border for three months. And so we want to ask you, you'd be perfect because you're a nurse and you already have your passport. And so I thought, no, I'm not a bit perfect. I am in the worst crisis of my life. I'm skinny as a rail, and I'm all traumatized, and I don't know which end is up. So I don't think God wants me to go to Thailand to relieve missionaries at this time in my life. But I said to her, well, I'll pray about it and see what God says. So we're in the country in Montana, and this, the block, the country block is one mile on each side. And so I'm used to running that, and so I run two miles praying about that. And then I ran the next two miles listening, and I didn't hear anything. And then when I got home and I opened the door to go into my house, I heard, well, ask God for the money if he wants you to go. So I asked God for the money if he wants me to go. The next day she called me. She says, you'll never guess what, but we've got the money for you to go with your boys and the visa and a box of medicine you can take. And I stopped, I was driving my car, I stopped and my mouth flew open and I said, that was you, Lord. And so in less than 30 days, we were on an airplane going to Thailand, believing the missionaries. I'm gonna leave a whole lot out right now because I'm gonna take you to where I am now. I stayed at that school, not three months, I stayed 10 months. And then the Lord put me in a little village, isolated village deep in the jungles of Thailand and that's where I've been for the past um, almost 10 years. So I want to talk about reckless abandonment. When I went to Thailand, I left everything. And then I fell in love with the Koran people. They have been tortured in Burma. They're real homes in Burma, but the Burmese hate them and the soldiers war against them for 65 years. They torture them, burn their villages, and chase them out. Many have fled to the jungle five or six times in their life to stay alive. And then consequently they flee into Thailand and they live in refugee camps along the border. But in the last 65 years, many have migrated up in the mountains. So that's where I am and there's little uh, Karen villages all spotted through those jungle mountains and they do not know God and they many have never heard the name of Jesus. And so when I went there, three things told me it was God's will. One, somebody donated me enough money to buy a truck, a four-wheel truck, because it's horrible roads out there. And Dan Bledjaw, who is, was the principal at the school at the time, he heard God calling to come and help us. So those two things, and then knowing the people don't know God. I know God wants me there. So it has been a wonderful experience. And I want to stand here before you and tell you that, you know, God came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. He doesn't mean part ways so that you carry scars and you go around with a long face all the time. No, he finishes the work to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. And I can st testify to you right now tonight that I am healed and that I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. And that when I went to Thailand and fell in love with these people, I have, uh, I'm the happiest and God filled my hands with work to do for him. So the most important thing is to have reckless abandonment. I love it because reckless means to me a real urgency and 100% go in for something. And then abandonment has a, a meaning in the dictionary. This one works. 
In the dictionary, it says to hand over, put in someone's control, to give up completely. Is not that what God wants us to do? Hand over our lives, our homes, our hot water, our microwaves, our uh, American style of living, if it has to be, all our money, all our friends, all our family. Give it all to God. Why do we hold back? Because when we give it, he's going to let us have what's best for us, and he's going to put us where, where we can use our talents and our personality and our character and our life for him. And we're going to be happy. If we hold on to it, we're going to be miserable. So I never looked back, and the things that I had in America, all of it, I never saw it again. And uh, Mrs. White says, only those who will become co-workers with Christ, only those who will say, Lord, whoa. all I have and all I am is thine, will be acknowledged as sons and daughters of God. And later it says, only this way can he save us. I think it's really important. And so we need to take a really close look at our lives and say, Lord, really, in the bottom of my heart, all the way through, I want to give you everything. And uh, God will not disappoint you. When you do that, those that honor me, I will honor. And he can do great things for us. Our only hope of salvation is to give all to the master. If the things of this world are cherished, however uncertain and unworthy they may be, they will become all-absorbing. So here I am. I'm with the, the people in the jungle. They're living like they lived in Burma 100 years ago. Some are very dirty, very poor. Some children have no parents uh, to take care of them. It just quit. Oh. Some people, some of the children have no food to eat and they don't have anybody to care for them. They do not take baths ever, and they're very poor. Some, though, are a little better taken care of, but all of them are the most precious children. You cannot see them without falling in love with them and remembering them for life. All the people, young and poor, are uh, heavy on my heart. This is where I am, and John already told you I'm somewhere in these jungle mountains. He can find me on Google Map, and I cannot find myself there. <laughs> and as I said, all through the jungle mountains, there's little villages. Most of them are uh, little huts. Some have tin or tile roofs. Uh, but each of these villages are full of people that are worshiping the devil and partly mixed with Buddhism and uh, they are very poor. Now, this is what the children look like when they first see me, because I'm the only white person <laughs> over there. And I'm very strange looking to them with white and white. And so they cry. Even if they see me from the back door there, they, the little babies will cry because they have seen me. It's not very nice for me and my ego. But later, when they get older, they love me. So I am very happy now. He's already stolen part of my program, but I will tell you, this is Bledjaw. He has stayed with me and worked with me for 10 years. He is not a person that's going to give up when times get tough. And when we go through crisis, he is going to stay by your side, and he's going to work. And the thing about this young man is that his heart is the same as mine. He is in love with the people, and his first primary concern is to save them for heaven. Whatever way it takes, whatever we have to do. And so we are united on this front. And that's what it takes to be there. Many people have come to visit me and, and they stay for a few days, but there's no electricity, there's no phone, there's no internet, there's no shopping, there's nothing. So if you're not in love with the people and have Jesus love in your heart, you can't stand it. You can't wait to get out because you want to be on Facebook and you want to be on this and that. And so that's not the thing we need. So we pray every day for unity. If the devil comes in and divides, you cannot stand. The mission fails and souls are lost. So it's really important. We have three ways of transportation, the track, the motorbike, and walking. We do many miles with the backpacks. This is his family, and because we've worked together for 10 years, he is my son, and these are my grandchildren. We're very close. Uh, this is the boot. Uh, Pagoda that is halfway to our village. If we can take a shortcut, we're going to get to our village quite quickly. But if there's any amount of rain or anything 
uh, tree falls or the bank caves in a little bit more, we can't go that way. So we have to go two and a half hours more. So in order to get to the main road, we have to drive uh, on on a good day, three hours, but on a bad day, five, four and a half to five hours. Um, people worship Buddha, they worship the temple, they worship the monk. That's not in my village, but it's on one of the mountainsides. My people think that these devil strings will protect them from all sickness and from all danger. And uh, they believe that if those strings come off, the spirit will leave them. And if the spirit leaves them, they will get sick. If it goes too far away, they will die. So they have all kinds of ceremonies to call the spirits back. And the children and the adults, everybody has strings around wrists, neck, waist, and ankles. They have little places in their house where they have Buddha and devil worship trinkets and worship things. And uh, it's very hard for them to understand about a loving God. There are sorcerers and witch doctors that the people still go to. This is a sorcerer. His brother's name is uh, Mupo and his brother Mupo visited a family one time. Karen people eat together a lot and they eat their rice and when they're finished they're supposed to wash their own plate. This is Karen culture. And so uh, he finished his food and he didn't wash his plate but he gave it to the wife. So the husband said that's not right. You should wash your plate. Then the next day he came back and he ate there again and he left food on his plate and he just shoved it over to the wife. And so the husband scolded him a little bit and said, you don't, don't do that. And so the sorcerer went over to him and flicked him three times over the liver. And that was a curse. Witch doctors try to heal you, sorcerers try to kill you, put curses on you. And then immediately that man started having pain in his liver. In uh, two months he was in the hospital and the doctor said liver cancer. But everybody knew he had the curse. In three months he died. And before he died, he told his family, uh, after I die, cut my abdomen open. So after he died, they cut his abdomen open. Inside was thousands and thousands of fish eggs. And a lot of times with these sorcerers, if you cut the stomach open, they found a shoe, they find a rat or a rodent, anything they might find in the stomach. So that is the devil worship that's going on all around me. I'm learning more and more about their ceremonies and sacrifices and customs uh, every year. There's so much. Now, these people are so primitive that when I first went there, some of the older men, like that one, he said, is it true that the white people still eat the Karen babies? And so some of them still think that. This is their cooking place. They cook in an open fire in the middle of the hut, bamboo hut. And of course, it's all black and smoky in there, not healthy. They cook their rice and eat their rice every day. But this is the way they cook their food. We eat with them quite often. They eat most anything. This little girl, cute little girl, she sat opposite me in the clinic one day, and the usual Karen greeting, we say, Ame Wilia, and that means, have you eaten yet? And so she says, ah, really, which means, yes, I've eaten. And then the next thing that you kind of want to say, what did you eat? So, na amenule, I say, and what did you eat? She says, you, and you is the Karen name for rat. That pretty little girl had rat for breakfast. In fact, that's quite a normal thing for the people to eat. The little boys have rat traps made out of bamboo, and they catch many. Some are small, and many of them are the field rats that are this long. They're the kind that come in my house, that kind. So here they are. Sometimes uh, the little boys came to this one house and gave the lady 60 of these little rats, and she's roasting them over the fire. This is how they cook. Now I want you, do you have sound on this? If you turn it up, uh, this is her roasting this rat. <laughs> and they know that I'm vegetarian, so they will try to get me anything that's not meat. They don't really know. One time they gave me grubs because they didn't think grubs were meat. They eat dogs, they eat puppies, they eat certain spiders and snakes, toads and frogs. They eat just so many things that, that move. So sometimes I'm sitting right beside the people eating the rats. Uh, but three days a week we go to another village and we first of all treat the sick, then they cook us a food and we usually have rice and uh, chili, that's chili paste right there. 
and uh, then some kind of gourd that was cooked yesterday that's covered with flies. And so we sit and we eat with our fingers. And uh, then after that, we have a worship, which is just the best, the best part. This is our house that we moved into when we first went. It's a bamboo hutch. We treated patients in the middle of the house. And the, it's a bamboo floor. And the babies don't have diapers. And the adults spit and, it, and push it through the cracks of the bamboo. So I, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, if I could just have one little cement room, I could keep the floor clean. I could get Clorox and just keep that floor clean. Wouldn't that be nice, Lord? Just one little room. And we cook at night. We have to work by candlelight because we didn't have any electricity. We uh, actually cooked outside for quite a while. We had nothing. It took us 10 minutes to move in there. But the people came, and we didn't have any hard medicine or anything to give at first. But everything that we had, we gave our clothes, the food, what medicine, uh, anything they needed, we would give. And as we gave, God gave more to us. And you know, God wants to, us to ask for big things. He doesn't want us to ask for some small room that we can wash the floor with the clinic. He wants to give us big things. I want to tell you miracle after miracle. I don't have time because I have a lot to tell you. But this is what God gave us, and this is what we have now. And that building is cement. We hauled every bit of it in ourselves with the first truck we had. We ruined the truck, of course. And that building is 14 meters long. And you see the door on the on. Uh, the right, right there, that goes into our living area, our house, and the door on the left goes into the clinic, and then the storeroom, and then the bathrooms. And we don't know how to do blueprint, we don't know how to build, but the builder came and he uh, nailed up our handwritten blueprint on a post and he built that. And we just had a straight roof and he did something else to the roof. And uh, this is a drone showing our place, our village. That's Wasada, actually, not our home. Our house. That's the church in the very front. And the school is to the right. It's a small government school with about 170 children. I'm the school nurse, of course. So now we have a solar system, and I don't have to walk the asthma patients and the pneumonia patients down the hill to go to a small uh, hut where they have a little solar panel so that I can do a breathing treatment. And then they have to walk back up the hill so that I can finish and listen to their lungs and that. So now I have a solar system, and I'm going to take you for a tour through my house. Here is looking in the first door on the living side, looking straight at the kitchen. And to the right is the two bedrooms, Ledja in the front, me in the back. And even a table they made us. We sat on the floor for a long time. Then the next area, this is my clinic. This was the day after, before I left, right on um, June 16. I took that picture of the clinic I have now. Cabinets to work from. I have a stool for the patient, a stool for me, and one for blood jaw. I have a counter. I have everything I need. I'm so thankful. Now, this is my patient card file. Every card is for a patient. We have now seen patients from 96 different villages. And they come from far and near, some many times, but others, they just come. And you wonder why they'd have to travel so far to come. Now I have a table to work from and to keep my records. I even have a baby scale. And I have three seasons up in the mountains. Cold season is very cold. It's November, December, January, and a little bit of February. These people, the middle one is from Alaska. And she is in my house in December, and she's freezing. They are sitting inside the sleeping bags. Because it's cold, it's the same temperature in my house as outside of my house. And you can see your breath. So it's very cold, and we take a different bath. And so when that cold water hits you, it's very cold. And when you finish, you just numb. You can't feel your skin at all. <laughs> so the three seasons are very harsh, really. The cold season, then the hot season, which is my favorite, but it's full of bugs. And then the rainy season, which is the longest, so you're going to see a lot of rain and mud. Here's the rainy season, the planting of the rice. Everybody works, even the children, the babies. And as John showed you some of these pictures, I just picked the more recent pictures because 
June uh, 16, we took the truck out. Now, usually we got to take the truck out before June 16 because it starts raining kind of the end of May. And we have to be careful and we can, oh, we can make one more trip to bring in supplies. We needed to bring in some fruit trees to plant them. And so then I needed, to, I really wanted to preach that last Sabbath in that church before I left, see the people one more time. So that truck was still there by the 16th, which was Sunday of June, and it's raining. And so when we have rain, even just the first rain, it's dangerous. It turns into a disaster. And you can, you know, pictures won't tell you, but sometimes the road just opens up and you can actually just put your truck right in there neatly. <laughs> um, so this is June 16. We got stuck five or six times. I lost track so many times. And if we didn't have the winch, I think we'd still be there in the mud. Uh, yeah, I think you showed that picture. But, you know, pictures and words just can't really describe to you how bad the roads are because they're not all that wide. Some are very steep and, and they always have a cliff on one side and a bank on the other side. And you can get into trouble really, really quick. We pray very hard before we go. And you've already seen that. We don't need to waste time on that. Ready? Ready? <laughs> that wench saved us. We might still be there. And then these people, I don't know why they're carrying this load, and then look at this mud. And the longer it rains, the deeper the mud gets. So you're walking and it goes right up to your knees. And it's so hard to get through, and then the leeches come out as soon as it gets wet. So you're full of leeches. These people are very unique. They always get the rope out and try to pull their cells out. This is one time uh, several years ago when we were coming out of the ocean and had a sudden rain and the red mud came across a part of concrete and it's a very steep place and turns right. And so as we were coming down there we went into a skid and that truck, when it skids you know, it picks up velocity and the truck is just flying towards the cliff and this cliff is the steepest, straightest down cliff with no big trees to stop your fall. And we should have gone off that cliff and right on the edge you can see the back wheels right on the edge is very soft right there. So, you know, we get real attached to our vehicles because angels touch them. And that angel stopped that truck right on the brink. It took us almost two hours to get out of that dangerous situation. We're trying to use the wench, but the trees are too small. We're pulling them down and we struggle right there. We can't even wear our shoes because you can't even stand up. Red mud is the most slippery. Also, if you break down out there in the jungle, there's 23 kilometers of mud, of dirt road. And so if something happens up there, it's really hard to get a mechanic to fix it. Praise the Lord, it doesn't happen much. But if it does, you call somebody to come up on a motorbike and fix the problem, but it might last one or two kilometers and it'll break again. So it's not fun. Here's our other way of transportation is the motorbike, like he said. And we're on this motorbike a lot. We probably a third of our time is spent traveling. And we'll go to another village three days a week. And we have the rainbow bag with our medicine and medical supplies. And then uh, we usually bring the picture roll. Pictures are worth thousands of words out there. The people really respond to the pictures. And even though they say they don't understand, we repeat simply all the time. It's harder to speak to ignorant people about God in a simple way than it is to talk to you guys. Because to make it simple is hard. And our motorbike has to go places where it shouldn't go. Just a video to try to show you how it goes. Me on the back, taking a video. Actually, this bridge right here, it broke. And three days later, that thing broke. And a couple, when a couple were going over it on their motorbike, they really got hurt. And then this one is to show you kind of how steep it is off to the side. It's always narrow and very steep. I'm barely hanging on with my camera up here. When the conditions get really bad, I can't take any pictures. It, this is good condition. Don't get car sick. It just drops straight off on the left and then straight up on the right. You've got to have nerves of steel because he's driving and we just really take chances a lot of times and we usually make it. However, I have totally flipped off the back of that motorbike uh, three times, head over heels. Here's the chain. This really helps a lot. I'm like the 
the tail wagging the dog sitting on the back of that bike. But on a good day, I'm just as at home on the back of that bike as I am in the truck. And this is a, a picture Bledjaw sent me just yesterday. He'd gone back into the village by himself to treat the sick, to preach the Sabbath sermon, and to fight the mud. And he's doing um, a great work. I'm so proud of him. This is not us, but when it's not deep mud, it's like ice. This is steep, and it, this is a difficult thing. I kind of wanted to skip that part. Oh, it's hard. These are Thai people, up, but this is our driveway. This is all our driveway. It's raining right now. Rainy season, it rains constantly. You never see the sun, blue sky, stars, moon, nothing for four or five months. It's really steep. Last year, uh, the last two weeks in, um, in May, we had a terrible storm. It rained for two weeks. Trees came down, the mountainsides just slid down. The big trees were all over the road. You couldn't even walk past some of the places. So in those two weeks, uh, from our village to get out, you have to cross the river twice in the water. The third time you cross it, because it's snaking like this, we have a bridge, but the first two is very deep. Well, it rained so hard, we thought we'll never get the truck out. And we really, I don't think any patients will come today. So in those two weeks, I'm kind of like, oh, we can rest a little bit. Uh, because this is all happening. Three villages came together to saw. They get a big saw like this and do it by hand and, and get rid of these trees. And so they tried to clear a way um, so that we could drive out. But it took a long time to, to clear this place. Now, you know, day after day, you know, the Lord tests us and tests our character. Patients come when you're cooking, or they come when you just sit down to eat, or there's something really big and you don't get time to eat and you've got to go. And the same thing happened here. It says in all our service, a full surrender of self is demanded. It's not just suggested. It's demanded. And I can feel that. I can feel that almost daily. So this particular day, while we're sitting there resting, thinking no patients are coming, uh, somebody comes to our door and says, you know, a lady fell down in this next village. Can you come and check her? She's really hurting. Now, we've got this rule that no matter what, we're going to go and check that patient. Because sometimes they'll make it sound like the person's half dead, like this is really bleeding on, or profusely, or they just can't walk, or they're just dying. You think, oh, no, and you go, and there's nothing wrong with them. Other times, they'll make it sound minimal and okay, you know, it's just a little diarrhea. And you go and that person's half dead or three quarters dead and you need to hurry up and do stuff. So we answer every call. So this is no exception. We need to go, but it's hard to even walk because where I am <coughs> right there, it's really on the road. But the mountain slid down so far that the road is really way down here. And we have to climb way up there and come around. And it's really, really um, like quicksand. Hard to do. <coughs> I said, I'm going down. not fun. <laughs> I 
And Bledjo was taking the video, you know, and he said, well, I'm sorry, I would have come and helped you, but I wanted to take this video. <laughs> So now you get to see it too. And to get to that village took a long time because then we had to climb another mountain and go above the landslide to get past that one. So it took us a really long time to get to that village. But when we got there, I see this woman. Well, sorry. It's kind of slow, so I don't trust myself. Okay, so when I get to the village, I see this woman, and I know instantly what's wrong with her, and I think the medical people would know. She fell hard, and she's not very light. She's a little heavy, and you see this left leg is shorter than the right leg, and it's rotated outward. She's broken her hip. And we're in the middle of a storm, and she's in a faraway village, and you'll, we had a hard enough time getting there. And so we're sitting together with all the villagers trying to decide what to do, how to get her, because she needs to go to the hospital, and she's in a lot of pain. I feel really sorry for her. So then they finally say, well, if we can get her to your village, will you take her to the hospital? And so we say, we'll do our best. And I'm thinking of that raging river. It is really high. We don't have a snorkel on our truck, and it looks like it could just roll the truck over. But we say, OK. And, and so then we went home. And you saw this. My boot comes off. We've got to go the same way back. And then I'm thinking all the way, you know, these people have got to carry this woman all the same way. Anyway, you can see the water is to the right here. Let's stop that. That's enough of that. <laughs> the strength of those who in faith love and serve God will be renewed day by day. Do you believe it? Amen. It's true. I'm standing here to tell you. It's, it's true. And about two hours later, they came. And they had her on a bamboo pole. And they stuffed her through the back door of my truck. And it, it went, the pole went right through the truck. And they just let her off from her uh, blanket there into the truck. And off we went, crossing the river two times. But you know, when you're working for God and you're in the center of God's will, it's the safest place on earth. And when you give all to God, he gives all to you. And so we passed those two rivers. I taught Bledjaw to drive because it's very tiring. And now he's a wonderful driver. This is one of the carriers. <coughs> and he uh, drove through that water. It came up half past halfway of the door twice and it's rocky on there too but we made it all the way to the hospital and that lady got taken care of properly and when I went to bed that night I was so thankful to God you know here's one more person that you've helped us to to save and when we go to different villages I can walk through the village and I can see older people and younger people and babies and they would have died if I hadn't been there and there they are they're alive and well Heaven is much nearer to the Christian who's engaged in soul winning than many suppose. This lady uh, is uh, on the right is Shepa and her mother. These are precious people in a faraway village. We go as often as we can. This lady has a problem. When she has children, she almost dies. She will not tie the tubes. She won't do any of that. She won't do anything. But if she's dying, she receives our help. God sends us there right on time. So twice we've saved her life, but it's not easy to get there. Here's the rainy season. This is quicksand, and there's only one um, fallen thin tree branch that you're standing on to get across. If you fall off of that, you might not get out because it's quicksand. See the mountain slid down in the back there. But anyway, we got out and we go and we teach the people about God. And often they'll say, no, we ask, do, they, do you understand? And they say, no, I don't understand. But we go repeat it and we, we tell them more and more. And week after week, we go and we tell the people the Bible story. And then pretty soon they're calling us to come. Can you come and have another worship with us? And so we go, you know, we don't know who God can save because they're not going to be like me. They grew up worshiping the devil and knowing nothing and eating everything. So God can save. So when we went the next time she had us cut off all the devil's strings off herself and all her children her whole family which is a big step because to them that is 
really a big deal. It means their, their health and their safety. So now she's a Christian and we, we go repeatedly. But every time she has a child, she almost dies. I'm giving her IV here. Her children are taking care of that new baby. Just before I came to America this year, she had her ninth baby. That's not it, this is it. And she very sick. I did all I could to help her and uh, then I had to leave. So often we do this and we pray and pray and pray. Time and again, the next time I go back, they're well. So I'm praying that she also will be well. That day her whole house was filthy. The children all had diarrhea. It was bacterial, dysentery and very sick. So. Uh, it took a lot of work to help clean and to take care of these little children. Never does the gospel put on an aspect of greater loveliness than when it's brought to the most needy and destitute places. It encourages me a lot. God reaches hearts through the relief of physical suffering. A seed of truth is dropped into the mind. It's watered by God. Much patience may be required before this seed shows signs of life, but at last it springs up and bears fruit unto eternal life. Only God knows. And our job is to sow the seed and let the Lord do the rest. And you know, Mrs. White also says that when you're working for God, heaven terms everything a success. So let's not be discouraged. Let's speak faith, act faith, live faith every day. Elephants are a nice uh, thing at first, I thought. They were tame and people riding them. That's really neat. Elephants are smart. I love all animals. But then the wild elephants came and joined them. And when the, when the oil comes from the side of their head, they are very dangerous. The encyclopedia would even tell you they need to be isolated. Well, there's no isolation in the jungle. It's free range. They go everywhere they want. If you see this footprint and if you see this Next thing, you're going to see this. And at first, I was counting on my hands how many times we'd met the elephants face to face because we take patients out. We go back and forth a lot. We travel a lot, more than anybody else. And so you would think we would, we would meet a lot of elephants, and we do. But the people are all amazed because we've never been charged. These elephants, they don't want anybody moving or making a noise around them. But you might be in your truck or on your motorbike and come around a blind corner and meet that big guy face to face. And there's nothing you can do. People drop their bikes and run. Sometimes the elephant will crush the bike flat and uh, charge the person. Sometimes they get away and sometimes they don't. Not too many months ago, a couple just got married for three, week, three months, they were married on a motorbike and this happened to them and they ran and the man got away and the woman did not. And the other thing about these elephants are when, some, when they kill somebody, the villagers bury them in the jungle, dig a hole and bury. And the elephant will wait four or five days till the body decays and then they will go back there and dig it up and eat it. Somebody told me one time they don't believe it, that's okay, but... I live there. And then, <laughs> this is another elephant coming towards us, but thankfully we're on the concrete part and we can get away, but if we're on the dirt part, this, you can't, they will run 20 miles an hour and you can't drive your truck in some of those places 20 miles an hour. But you know, the angels are bigger than the trucks. This man is sick, this uh, man in the back, and it took us a long time to get this far because he had to stop every two minutes. And we get up there and there's three motorbikes and six people saying, don't go, don't go, there's an elephant up there. And at the top of the mountain, it's always misty and it's cold and windy because it's at the top of the mountain. And so we wait, but we think we've got to take him to the hospital. So we, we get on the bike and there's the, him and his son and me and Bledjaw, and then another couple decided to go. But nobody wanted to go first, so Bledjaw and I go first. And so I'm looking, and it's, it's misty, and you know, there's big boulders. And so you're looking at, around the first corner, okay. Around the second corner, you're looking, and there's more fog and mist, and it's okay. And then the third corner, and you think, is that a boulder right there or not? And just then the boulder raised its head. It's as close as the back door. And so the people on the back of the motorbikes jump off and the driver spins the bike around and we jump back on and off we go tearing away. And the people are saying, is it coming? Is it coming? We're first to meet it and we're the last to leave it. And I'm looking and it didn't come. And then we heard 
We went back here, we heard it to the left, another one, and another one. One time there were 18. So you just pray. Eventually we got the man to the hospital. This is another time we met the elephant. And another time, and a little dust bath here in the corner. They're, they're just uh, everywhere. They're really big. I didn't take this picture, but just to show you, they destroy trucks. Even the government trucks bigger than our truck. So nothing is safe when, when you get an angry elephant. These spiders can kill you. I've had them on me. God does not ask us to do in our own strength the work before us. He's provided divine assistance for all emergencies to which our human resources are unequal. That spider was on my back one time. I was taking a bath with the dipper. I think they like water. I'm taking a bath, you know, mm -mm. and then I feel something on my mid-back, you know, the place where you can't reach. And I thought my hair fell down, because it was pretty long. And uh, I looked in the mirror and it was that, that spider. In the middle. It was later that Bledjaw told me, you know, those spiders kill you. They can kill you. So we don't have to be scared of anything, do we? This is my clinic, and the people will come. They come mainly for three reasons. Poor hygiene, poor nutrition, and not drinking enough water. They'll work on their rice gardens all day long and barely drink. They think a lot, but they have a coconut shell. They dip, they take two swallows, they throw the rest away. And they do that three or four times a day. That's a lot, but it is not. I have a urine dipstick with 100 sticks in it, and 80% have UTIs, have infections. And some people have kidney failure. So we really preach. This is my clinic. Sometimes a lot of people come in and these people are very curious. This woman has a toothache, and everybody's coming in, and the guy in there in the waiting room is standing on the bench to look around the corner and see what's going on. And so we treat the people. Sometimes they come from far away. They hire a truck, and they come, and we say, how come? How come did you come all that way two hours and you passed two clinics, and you could have gone to that hospital? And they said, we heard that you get well when you come here. And we said, it's not us, it's God, because we pray for the patients. And uh, God works wonders, and they get well. This group came, and they said, you know, we, we just had to come here because we noticed it really makes a difference when we get treated here. And one guy said, I don't know how come when I go to the doctor, he gives me paracetamol, and I don't get well, and you give me paracetamol, and I get well. I say, this is God. This is after church. There's usually a mob of people following me to the clinic after church. Some have come not to go to church, but just to wait for me. And others in the church, they come. Now we have many respiratory problems because you know the people are cooking in the middle of their house with all that smoke and then the cold season is very cold and they're staying huddled by the fire a lot and then rainy season goes without speaking because it is 100% humidity. humidity. We have wet clothes, we can't dry, we just wear them and that way they dry a little better. But the babies consequently have terrible lungs and I was an ER nurse for 23 years and I never heard lungs like I hear out there. But thanks to the Lord, he um, heals these people. Seldom do we have to take the baby to the hospital. Now, this is a oxygen concentrator. And uh, there's a lady here that came with me. Her name is Joyce. I'm going to talk about her later and show her picture. And I was in a, a Sabbath school class in College Dale last year. And they donated me. A lot of money and they knew I wanted an oxygen concentrator because this takes oxygen from room air and gives up to 5% uh, 5 liters per minute of oxygen to the people and so I have it now it's my newest addition in the clinic it works really really well I forgot to warn you you might want to close your eyes huh? <laughs> sorry just do it now Anyway, you know, a lot of people use machetes, and the machete knife is dangerous, and this guy was chopping a tree with it, and he was leaning against this thing, and he's, he slipped, and he just sliced his hand open from thumb to wrist, and he stuffed it with tobacco because he thought somehow that would help. So it took a lot of cleaning to get it all cleaned out, and then there's arteries in there, and the tendons were not cut. But you know, you do things over there that all my nursing experience here doesn't teach you to do. So uh, he would not have gone to the hospital, so I was really happy I was there. 
at the time, this is how we do our sutures on the floor. It's not totally sterile, guys, so don't, don't tell. Um, <laughs> But the people do not get infected, and we, I am just as clean as I can be, and I even have sterile drapes, and my sutures are sterile. So this is 16 stitches, and the guy healed up really, really well. He's very thankful. Other things we have because they don't have good hygiene is skin problems. Terrible. What's the children? And people don't like to get in the water. And so you, you have to fight them to even wash it and clean it and take care of it. Uh, we're constantly cleaning skin. This is an uh, opium addict. We live in the highest circle of opium in Thailand. It is the, the most opium where we are. And so we're really a detox unit also to help them get off to, uh, Opium. This guy, we've seen him time and again. See how swollen and tight his arms and hands are. They have to stick the needle. He's, he um, mainlines opium. He does it three times a day. So he's ruined all these veins. He's going down here. He's getting veins wherever he can find them. It's really sad. And then when they're really sick, you can't start an IV hardly. So we've squeezed pus out of this guy from all angles. It seems so sad. This one's smoking opium. This one has an open syringe behind his ear, ready to stick it in there anytime he wants more opium. His great heart of love was stirred to its depths for the ones whose condition was the most hopeless and who most needed his transforming grace. And then, read this, I entreat the heralds of the gospel of Christ never to become discouraged, never to regard the most hardened sinner as beyond the reach of the grace of God. This is a caterpillar. They have fur. There's thousands of different kinds of furry caterpillars, but you avoid them. But they're camouflaged really well. If they touch you, what happens when they're threatened is they eject their fur. Dogs die because they're sniffing close to the ground and, and it gets in their trachea and they swell and die. But people, if it touches them, they don't mind it. The first day, not so bad. But the second day, worse. Third day, worse. This woman is the worst I ever saw. You might want to close your eyes. It gets a little graphic. The worst I ever saw. She has already had to have her little finger removed and the next finger had to go and her hand was black on the back. So not a good situation. These caterpillars are very poisonous. These are poisonous. These are um, 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 green pit vipers. I couldn't think of it. This is the most aggressive snake out there. They're biting the people because they're in the grass when they're clearing their rice gardens and, and the weeds and stuff they bite. This guy was bitten the day before, so the poison already built up. They usually have to stay in the hospital a while. Now, I didn't take this picture because I don't take pictures of cobras. I just get away. But sometimes, you know, you're walking on a little path and it's, the grass has grown over and you stumble over something and you realize that was a snake. And cobras come in all colors. They can be beige, yellow, black, or like that stripe. That's a king cobra. And the black ones can be king. They can spit six meters straight in your eye and you have two minutes to live. Or they can run really fast. You can't run, outrun them. And if they bite you, you've got two minutes. It's a neurotoxin. So you, you, can't, you can't survive, especially as long as it takes us to get you to a hospital. You couldn't. These we kill. This one we kill. This one was coming in our house. And the redneck uh, keel back. It's a poisonous snake. I've killed those guys before. They're trying to get in the house. Okay, this is my first tooth I ever pulled. I held back from pulling teeth for a long time because I was not going to do that. Somebody had given me some old instruments like that, and then one time a guy came, you know it really hurts, I've never had a toothache, it really hurts, and so they went home and cut it out with a machete. And then they got an infection, and then they come to me, and I think, oh Lord, I can do better than that. And so I have the book where there is no dentist, and I'm reading that, and I've got that, and so that's my first tooth, and that's my first uh, patient. And so I came to America one year and I prayed and I said, Lord, I need, I'm not doing this justice. I had pulled 30 teeth successfully. I don't know how, but I did. And, and then I'm praying, oh Lord, I came to America. I went to Faith Camp West and this guy was there with his wife, Jack and Katie Hamilton. They're from Alaska. That was their first faith camp. And I was telling my story and I'm, I had three presentations and he's sitting in the front all the time. And this one time meeting after I talked about that tooth, I'm walking out and he 
falls in step with me and he says, I'm a dentist. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I've got no business pulling teeth. I'm really sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. And so, so he's so nice and he took me to where he's staying and he bought a box of instruments out. And I said, oh, did you think you were going to pull teeth here? And he said, no, I was impressed that somebody might need them. And he answered all my questions and he gave me those instruments. And then, best of all, he came to visit me. He came uh, for a week from Alaska and visited me and we were able to pull a lot of teeth together, traveling from place to place. It helped me so much and now I have really state-of-the-art instruments and I feel so much better about it. Not good, but so much better. <laughs> And then, didn't Jack Hamilton and his wife come back again? And uh, he gave me a, um, a cleaning, what do you call it, machine to clean teeth. But the teeth are a disaster, but a lot of them, you can clean them and, and get good results. And uh, this is pulling teeth in the village. Then just recently a dentist came with a group. I'll show you the group later. But this guy, Dr. Hold, helped me so much more to really get the tooth numb. He's got these techniques and different needles and uh, different information on the xylocaine. Oh, he helped me tremendously. We pulled tooth after tooth after tooth, come rolling out. Then when he left, I get all these rotten teeth. So. I want to tell you about this man. This man right here is 70 years old. His name is Blee. And Blee uh, told his cousin right here that he wanted to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's the head elder of the Baptist Church of a distant village. But he wants to be a Seventh-day Adventist because this guy, if the Baptists come and they start a church and they leave some local to lead it and do it, and they barely can read. So this guy was leader of the Baptist Church. He had just built this church behind him. And there he is. He had just built that church. And so uh, he's saying, I need to know more about the Seventh-day Adventists. They're over there in Biota. And this man says, yeah, he got baptized two years ago. But he said, I'll get you Gail and Bledjaw because they can answer your question. I don't know. I'll get them. So we went and visited him. He has stopped, already stopped eating meat. He's read the Bible. He thought he would die soon. He's over 70. So he wants to keep the seventh day or he's not going to go to heaven. So he uh, recently stopped smoking. He tried it again and it tasted terrible. He's smoked for 65 years. And uh, they start at three years old, you know. And now he's, uh, we can get him for church sometimes. It's a long ways away. This is his younger daughter. The two daughters and the man will, will join our church. The wife is miserable. Look at her, not smiling. Her friends are Buddhist and Baptist, so pray for her. And so we preach. We keep preaching, and we, we keep um, telling them more and more deeper and deeper stuff, the people that come to church. When we first went to church there, we had four or five people attending church. And uh, that was the first four or five years. Now we have 30 to 60 people coming to church. And in this last year, we have had more visitors come to see us, groups of people, than we, well, we never had. So this last year, full of visitors, and we'll tell you about it. And that's, uh, when church attendance is really good, we have that many people. As the disciples meditated upon God's pure, holy life, they felt that no, no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great. I wonder what happens to us. Do we feel that way? Those disciples were on fire for God. We can never, ever regret our self-denying efforts, persevering labors. Jesus' patience, forbearance, and earnest heart yearning for souls that might have been lost if we neglected our duty or became weary in well-doing. How much more precious is heaven to those who have been faithful in the work of saving souls as there's lost souls all around us. We can see them everywhere. So Pastor Martin Kim came. In the last two years, we have had evangelism each December. December is when the people are free from working on their rice gardens. So it's a good month to have evangelism. Pastor Martin came for a year. We had a great attendance. I went the wrong way, sorry. And so every, hmm? He came for a week, you said a year. year. Oh, he came for a week. Did I say a year? Yeah. I'm getting excited. You're holding the clock up and it's making me nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost finished, guys. So we had a wonderful attendance that 
uh, week that he spoke and people were baptized. These four people were baptized when a group of Karen young people came. They're taking a seminary course, kind of a crude seminary course in Mesot. One of them is a, uh, had been baptized last year from our village. He will come back and work with us. So four were baptized then. And I want to tell you the next group that came was from Fountain View Academy. Do you know? Do you know them? 17 people from Fountain View Academy, a famous school, came to our village. More wanted to come, but uh, they needed to split between the school on the border and us. So they actually came and uh, they sang and they did programs. And the people came, there was over 100 people coming to our church to listen to them and to be blessed by their music. We went to a village with them and they sang song after song while we're treating patients. It was a wonderful experience. I want to um, just play one song that they sang. In my church, is it not beautiful? I just got to move on because time is short. This is Pastor Jimmy, and he is a Karen pastor from uh, the border there. He understands our people, has actually been in our village, but now he is over all the Karen people in America. And I was lucky to, to visit him, and he consented to come and do evangelism in our village. So I want to end on that evangelistic program, and I want to tell you, I also was able to go to the Philippines three times this year and preach to the young people there thousands of them, and they're on fire for God. And while I was there, I found uh, a doctor and his team that will come and do evangelism this December. So, you know, God is doing great things. We can only just um, expect great things from him. And this pastor came also to help. We even had the media truck. I don't have time to explain it. But the media truck came and in my village with three cameras, they recorded the whole thing so we can share it to other villages and other people uh, throughout the, the jungle. It was well attended morning and night. And at the end of that evangelistic program, 16 people were baptized in the river. This is in December. And there they are. I will end on this video. And I just want to thank you so much for having me come. And I'm so blessed to see you and talk to you in my home mother tongue and uh, get acquainted with others that share my passion for souls. So here's the video. <laughs> So yesterday was a high Sabbath. Um, that was the day we were to have a baptism for the second time in eight years here at the river. We had worked with several people very closely preparing them for baptism and we knew of a few that were ready but when Pastor Jimmy came and with his personality and his zeal visiting villages, talking to people and uh, doing services here, there were many people really interested in joining our church. And uh, because we've been here for eight years preaching uh, on Sabbaths, doing worships and uh, praying with the people, they know quite a bit, the people right around here that come to church, know quite a bit about the Bible. And there were 16 precious souls that uh, wanted to be baptized. So Sabbath after church, we all came down to this river. They were all baptized right here. I sat right here on the bank and I took pictures of everyone, but I just had to cry tears of joy because 
it means so much. We have been through so much darkness here and the people receive the light so slowly. It almost is imperceptible. I just want to encourage all of you to just uh, be part of God's work because it's so, some experience you can't uh, describe it. You got, you just feel good inside. Nobody else can feel that because of you helping other people, even though not much, a little bit, but you just feel good inside. So I just want you to have that experience here and forever also. We have no idea of the future, how much more uh, the Lord will do for us here in this place. It's, it's overwhelming and my heart is so full of joy. It's just running over all over the place. Dear Father in heaven, today our hearts are full. We are just so full of gratitude to you for being able to use little weak, sinful people as ourselves. Even though, though we've had a past of sin and, and sorrow, you can change and heal and you can do all things, Lord. You can even use us to show your glory to the people around us. I pray a blessing on each person here tonight. I pray that in their life and in their families, in their neighborhoods and communities, that you will use them in great ways. I thank you for this church and the missionary mindedness that the people here have as this church is growing by leaps and bounds, Lord. Bless it, your work is, is going to grow all over the world. There's so many places that haven't heard yet. Please help it to reach every corner of this world so you can come. There's so much sickness and suffering, but we see the power of God and we are so encouraged and we know that when we work for God, there's a lot more joy than sorrow and trials and sadness. So we give all to you tonight and we know that when we honor you, you will honor us in ways that we don't even expect, like opening the windows of heaven and there's not enough room to receive it. You're a great God of love and we love you too, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.